Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. Remember also that past performance, while relevant, is not a reliable guide to future performance. This week's big theme will be familiar to those who've been listening for the last few weeks, and it has been the continuing rise across the globe in government bond yields, which have now reached levels not seen for many, many years. The yield on the 30-year US Treasury bond, for example, popular known as the long bond, briefly topped 5% this week, a level it's not reached in 25 years, while the 10-year equivalent at 4.75% is the highest it's been since 2007. The story in the gilts market is not dissimilar, with the 10-year benchmark bond now yielding close to 4.6% and the 30-year 5%, a level also not seen for 20 years or so, and in Europe where yields are the highest since the Eurozone crisis a decade ago. Uh, The gap between the shortest and longest dated government bonds in the US, the so-called yield curve, is however narrowing in favour of the former, but the yield curve does remain inverted, although not to the same degree as before. Yields are simply rising across the maturity spectrum. Uh, Unlike last year's gilt sell-off after the Trust Administration fiasco, this bond yield surge is a global phenomenon rather than just one about the UK, and one that is producing record high real yields as well, not just nominal ones. This dramatic continuation of rising bond yields will come as a disappointment to those who have been hoping to see the pressure on interest rates peak and indeed perhaps see them come down. There's no shortage of views on offer about what lies behind all this, from those who believe that the central banks are actively seeking to create a recession as the only way to bring inflation back down to target and keep it there, to those who think, on the other hand, that it is the markets which are signalling to governments, and the US government in particular, that the surge in their debt obligations after a decade of low interest rates and public sector spending binges has become unsustainable. The market's bond vigilantes, in other words, who seem to have disappeared since their heyday in the 1990s, may be coming back. Ray Dalio, a well-known US hedge fund manager who runs Bridgewater Associates, said bluntly this week, we're going to have a debt crisis in this country. With the US federal deficit at a peacetime record 7% of GDP and set to rise further to levels not being seen outside wartime, bringing much higher funding costs in their wake. Michael Hartnett, the market strategist at Bank of America, noted that the speed and scale of the rise in yields over the past two years has created what he called the biggest bear market in bonds in history. Bond prices have reacted accordingly, with only a handful of the 62 gilt issues, for example, edging up on the week, and more than a third of them down by more than 3%. The economic data coming out of the US remains resilient, however, with another strong employment report on Friday, and that prompted a positive one-day reaction in the US equity market after a few days of weakness. The S&P 500 finished the week up 0.5% and Nasdaq was up a bit more, 1.5%. The UK and Japanese equity markets, in contrast, having closed earlier before that jobs report, were down 1.7% and 2.7% respectively. To add to an already confusing picture, oil prices were down sharply, back down to a little over $80 a barrel. While with US real yields rising, gold has dropped in dollar terms to under $18.50 an ounce, while the dollar continues to strengthen, all of which adds to the tightening financial conditions we are seeing around the world. Needless to say, with its heavy exposure to alternative asset trusts, many of which are highly interest rate sensitive, the investment trust index had another poor week, down 2.7%. It's now down 7% year to date, excluding dividends, with the average discount widening again to nearly 18%, which is close to the widest it's been so far this year, and by the same token, the widest it's been for several years. On my count, trusts with falling share prices outnumbered those registering gains by around 4 to 1 this week. To discuss these ominous developments, and with only a handful of results and corporate developments to report, I'm joined this week by two of our regular contributors, Peter Hewitt, manager of the CT Global Managed Portfolio, a fund of investment trusts, which has two share classes, an income class and a growth class, and by Matt Hose, Alternatives Research Analyst at the broking firm Jefferies. 
As well as giving their thoughts on the bigger picture, they will also be discussing with me what potential profitable opportunities may be arising from the sell-off. Before we get to that, a reminder that you can see a summary of the main share price, NAV and discount moves this week and year to date by subscribing to the Moneymaker Circle, our sister subscription offering, together with links to all the latest stock exchange announcements by investment companies this week, and our latest in-depth profile, which this week features Templeton Emerging Markets. And coming up, we have future profiles of international public partnerships and City of London. I'm also finalising my quarterly review of the markets and investment trust universe. Look away now, I'm rather minded to say, if you don't like the sight of red ink. Turning to the news, this week we did hear news of another trust merger being proposed, this time involving two Henderson-managed trusts, Henderson High Income, ticker HHI, and Henderson Diversified Income, ticker HDIV. The two companies have agreed terms for a deal that, if approved by shareholders, will see the shareholders in Henderson Diversified Income offer the choice between a cash exit at NAV minus 1% and a rollover into Henderson High Income. The enlarged trust will continue to be managed by the current manager of Henderson High Income, David Smith, and have continued with the same mandate as it has now, although that is slightly different from the current mandate of the Diversified Income Trust, which has somewhat more exposure to bonds. Henderson, the fund management company, is to make a cash contribution of up to $1.1 million to cover the cost of the deal and prevent dilution for shareholders in the High Income Trust. The board of Henderson Diversified Income say that the diversified income strategy they've been pursuing has, I quote, not anticipated the economic conditions which have prevailed, end of quote. Uh, Henderson High Income, on the other hand, has been a steady performer, has a, offers a yield of around 6.5% and has outperformed its benchmark over 1, 3, 5 and 10 years. They hope to complete this deal in January 2024. Also in the news this week with Pershing Square Holdings, ticker PSH, which announced that the SEC, the regulatory body in the States, has finally uh, given approval for the Pershing Square Spark to go ahead. This is a special purpose vehicle in which uh, Pershing Square hope to attract a company that would otherwise be going for an IPO on the US markets to do a deal with them, which allows them to bypass all the extra costs and so on that are involved in an IPO. In return, Pershing Square will stand to benefit from a issue of subscription shares that allow it to profit from any deal that subsequently appears. The shares in this one were still down 1.5% on the week, however. Elsewhere, we heard that Rockwood Strategic, ticker RKW, the UK Smaller Companies Trust is going to be implementing a 1 for 10 share split, which becomes effective next week, although the ticker will remain the same. Mighton UK Microcap Trust, ticker MINI, M-I-N-I, meanwhile said that it has fulfilled redemption requests for 18.7% of the share capital. This is an annual exercise that it offers to its shareholders. Unfortunately, this will take the market capitalization of this one, which has been badly hit by the decline in small cap values over the last 18 months, down to £40 million. ICG Longbow, ticker LBOW, a debt fund, said that it is continuing to pursue an orderly realization of its assets. It's going into wind down, but it did warn that delays are occurring due to difficult market conditions, and that sent the shares down quite sharply this week. Also in the news, the fact that James Dupper, a very experienced manager who worked for Majedi Investments for a long time until its recent takeover, uh, is stepping down in February 2024 after 36 years working in the investment trust business, stepping down as the manager of the Edinburgh Investment Trust, for which he took responsibility with his colleagues two or three years ago, following a change in manager. And finally, elsewhere, we heard from Octopus Renewable Energy Trust, ticker ORIT, that it's reached a conditional agreement to sell its two onshore wind farms in Poland to an affiliate of the Polish energy company Orlen. It expects to receive net proceeds of between 88 and 92 million for the sale, and it represents a 14% to 19% premium over the holding value of the wind farms as at the 30th of June reporting dates. The proceeds will be initially used to repay short-term debt but may subsequently be reinvested in other wind and solar farm projects. This is notable just as another example of what renewable energy trusts have been doing in the wake of their discounts widening in terms of taking important decisions about how they allocate their capital, whether that involves selling assets, refinancing or adjusting their balance sheets 
or share buybacks. Other renewables we've heard from who are doing something similar include Aquila European Renewables, Foresight Solar Fund and Downing Renewables and Infrastructure. Turning to results then, we've had two large investment trusts reporting annual results this week. The first of those is the Ruffer Investment Company, ticker RICA, which reported NAV total return for its latest 12-month period down 1.7%, and perhaps more disappointingly for its shareholders, a share price total return of minus 7.2% as the shares moved uh, from a premium to a discount. Ruffer is one of the trusts that uh, sit in the what I would like to call the defensive sector. It aims to produce positive and low volatile returns in nearly all market conditions, making this uh, recent downturn in performance more disappointing, as it freely admitted in its latest annual report. The first half of the year had actually been good. The second half, that was the second half of 2022. But the first half of this year was not so good with the uh, credit and equity protection derivatives that Ruffer uses to manage the risk of its portfolio, both costing money as the equity markets proved to be stronger than anticipated. The chairman, Christopher Russell, said the portfolio remains defensive, but the time will come, perhaps ahead of forthcoming elections on both sides of the Atlantic, when markets will begin to discount the policy pain that we're now going through and its subsequent effect. The portfolio structure will need to reflect that light emerging at the end of the tunnel, when, as the investment manager says in its report, it's not the Federal Reserve that needs to pivot, it will be the investors who need to change their strategy. The management company itself pointed out that it has been in a similar position before, drawing parallels between the situation in 2000 and 2007, ahead of significant market falls uh, that lie ahead. So it's still in bearish mode, this particular trust adding that feeling uncomfortable about its positioning is necessary if you're seeking to perform differently from the crowd. Also reporting annual results was Pacific Horizon, ticker PHI, which is managed by Bailey Gifford. And that also reported a disappointing annual result with NAV total return down 3.6%, which compares to its benchmark, the MSCI Asia X Japan index, which was up slightly at 0.8% in total return terms. Here too, the discount widened with a share price total return minus 8.9%, the discount moving out to around 8% during the reporting period. Notwithstanding that, the trust did succeed in issuing a small handful of shares at a premium and followed that by having to repurchase about five times as much at a discount, though both sums fairly small in overall terms. The gearing on this trust remained at 0% throughout the year, but the board said it was under active consideration at present. Pacific Horizon, which, as I've said, invests in Asia X Japan, has a similar growth strategy to most other Bailey Gifford trusts. As it happens, it's the best performer of Bailey Gifford's 13 trusts over the past five years and behind only Scottish Mortgage over 10 years, having delivered a return of 12.3% compound per annum. However, it's been very volatile, the shares of this one. Uh, It's the second year running. It's seen its share price fall, having had spectacularly good years in 2020 and 21. The manager, Roddy Snell, said that he had increased his exposure to China and to Vietnam, but has also marked down its private holdings. It's another Bailey Gifford Trust that has a mandate to include unlisted as well as uh, publicly listed companies in its portfolio. That was revalued more than twice, during the year, with the average movement in company valuations down 29.7%. Turning to interims, I'm only going to highlight a couple of these. Caledonian, ticker CLDN, the large multi-asset trust, reported NAV total return of 3.7% over its latest half-year period. Its portfolio is broken down into three main segments. Quoted equity, which was up 2.8%. Private equity capital, which was plus 5.9%. That particular result uh, benefiting from the agreed disposal of Seven Investment Management, which was announced recently, and its funds portfolio, which was up 4.6% over the year. Caledonia, it may be worth noting here, has a history of paying special dividends following large realizations in its portfolio. So it'll be interesting to see whether that is something that uh, follows after the very profitable sale of Seven Investment Management. Also reporting interims was ICG Enterprise, ticker ICGT, another private equity trust, one that specialises in mid-size buyouts and has a strong long-term record. 
It reported NAV total return of 0.8% for its six-month period, despite a loss on foreign exchange translation of 3%. It spent 6.5 million on buybacks during the period, but has reaffirmed its full-year dividend target of 32p. Gearing here was at just 4% of NAV. And ICG said that the revenue growth in its top 30 holdings had risen by 14.9% and earnings in the underlying companies by 14.7% over the period. But this was down about 7% compared to the 21% gains on both those metrics that have been seen in the previous year. And we also had results from North American Income Trust, ticker NAIT, where NAV total return was minus 3.2% versus a 1% fall in its income, and from Bailey Gifford China Growth, ticker BGCG, whose latest six-month results for the period to the 31st of July saw a more than uh, disappointing decline in NAV total return of 18.7%, which was 7% worse than the China All Share Index that it uses as a benchmark. Discount also widened here. And there are a number of other updates as well from some of the alternative asset trusts, which you can read about if you look at the Moneymakers website. My first port of call this week was to speak to Peter Hewitt, as I said, the manager of the CT Global Managed Portfolio Trust with its two share classes, one income, one growth, tickers CMPI and CMPG, respectively. And this trust has been one of the few minority that has been able to issue shares this year as it continues to trade close to par and is popular with retail investors. Obviously, the first thing we have to talk about, Peter, is what's been happening in the markets generally. And we have seen this uh, dramatic move in the bond market, particularly in the US, but also over here, with bond yields rising to levels that we haven't seen since the global financial crisis. And that despite the fact that many people were hoping that the Federal Reserve had stopped raising interest rates. So what do you think this is about? And uh, has it come as a surprise to you? I think it probably did, Jonathan, is my response. I think it was probably surprised the markets too. Because when the Federal Reserve indicated that they were, if not at the peak, not far off it, and to be honest with you, much the same with the Bank of England, I think there was a collective sigh of relief. But the bond markets, in the way that bond markets do, decided the emphasis from the Federal Reserve on actually interest rates may well be higher for longer, I think unsettled them. And the response was a sell-off, particularly at the longer end of of the bond market. And you saw US 10-year yields going from 4.3, 4.5 higher, maybe 4.7, 4.8 as we speak, and who knows, maybe through five. And so that's concerning. The reaction in equity markets were companies that are sensitive to moves in bond yields, and you could have the whole growth sector generally, has sold off quite sharply. It's not been quite so severe in the UK or in Europe, but still is there. But the US and the US bond market often calls the tune here. Are you one of those who say that the bond market is is normally right in the end? They've got a lot of things wrong in the last couple of years. Yes, I have a feeling you often get early indicators of change of trends in the bond market. And it may be that we are likely to tip into a recession. That's the uncertainty. I think that's unsettled equity markets. We just don't know. We have had one of the most, in inverted commas, forecastable recessions for about the last year now. So there's a side of us think, well, let's just get on and get it over with. Because I think at the moment it probably wouldn't be deep and long, but there is always that risk. And I think that means, for me anyway, the next three to six months, say between now and Easter, is the time of maximum uncertainty. And I think if you do get to, say, the beginning of the second quarter next year, things should be a bit clearer in terms of we're in a recession Interest rates are likely to come down. And of course, the investment trust sector, for better or worse, it is in the eye of the storm whenever interest rates do go up, particularly when they go up unexpectedly. We've seen that this year. A lot of people hope that the derating was over last year, which we saw, uh, which was uh, quite significant. But it actually has continued into this year. And in the last few weeks, given what's happened in the bond market, it's actually been getting worse, particularly in the alternative space, which seems to be reacting almost as a sort of knee-jerk 
reaction one for one with uh, every change in interest rate expectations. Yes, definitely. And alternatives have been impacted across the board. Anything that's reliant on things like a discount rate to value assets, which, for example, a lot of the renewables are, has sold off. And discounts across the board in the sector have just begun to widen a little. And the average discount is now about 18. It was 16 a month ago. It's not a significant move, but it's not a positive move. And I think particularly the alternatives have been impacted. Property, I mentioned renewables, but there's a whole raft of them there where the share prices are basically friendless at the moment. And I mean, across the sector more generally, I'm really not sure whether there's a lot of selling going on. But what you do know is there's absolutely no buying. There's a buyer strike on at the moment. There's a buyer strike on, and that is helping to accentuate uh, whatever discount moves we see. And there isn't enough liquidity out there, as it were, to, to solve that. We'll come on to what investment trusts can do about that, if anything. But first of all, let's just talk about your portfolio. You manage two portfolios, a growth portfolio and an income portfolio. And you do that through investment trusts. You're a fund of investment trusts, effectively. What have you been doing? Uh, Obviously, your performance uh, is down this year, not surprisingly, given what's going on. But what have you been doing in the last few months as this situation has unfolded? Well, Jonathan, last week we had the AGM of the Managed Portfolio Trust. And I gave a short presentation to shareholders then, which kind of outlined three key themes or have already put in place in the growth portfolio and to some extent also in the income portfolio where income can be accommodated. And those themes are, firstly, I have increased the exposure to UK equity trusts. And I think that's an important statement. I think the UK is extremely attractively valued. And I think investing in the UK now On a medium-term view, I think you could make quite a bit of money there. I particularly like investment trusts which are either specialists in or have a decent exposure to medium and small-sized companies. And I think what I've just said about the possibility of making money from current levels is particularly true there. Also, some of them are at quite wide discounts. Give you an example. I bought Aberforth smaller companies earlier in the year And at that stage, the portfolio is on a PE of 8. The overall PE of the UK market is 10, which is way beyond the 20-year average, which is about 14. It's the one major market that's below its long-term average. So you can see how the Aberforth portfolio really is quite inexpensive. I met them in the summer, and the PE of the portfolio moved to 7. So when the shares are on a 14, 15 discount... That's what the value of the portfolio is. I mean, I know you have to wait for valuation corrections to happen. I'm quite happy to do that. They pay a bit of a dividend yield as well. It's a big trust. It's over a billion in value. And it's an example of what I think UK equity trusts could offer. But there's a whole raft of them. I mean, I've increased my holding in Mercantile, Henderson Smaller Companies, Lowland, as well as Zaberforth and, and other ones too. So that's theme number one. Yes. What about uh, theme number two? Well, that is one that I'm now building up. It's now sort of 15 17% the growth portfolio and 7 or 8% of the income portfolio, and that is private equity trusts. And I think they just are a tremendous value opportunity just now. Discounts are extremely wide, still... 30, 35, 40% plus in some cases. Now, they've been that for the last year, I think in anticipation of major falls in asset values, which haven't happened. Indeed, assets, if anything, in some cases have edged ahead. And in speaking to managers, and I've done that, the outlook is still reasonable. You're not going to get massive growth in asset values, but you don't need that. They have been priced for a nasty recession. And as yet, that isn't happening. So what really has kind of crystallised this for me was the announcement in August by the board of Pantheon, which is one of the larger, more established private equity trusts. It's a billion and a half or more in value. And the new chairman has deliberately changed the capital allocation policy 
and they have said they wanted to buy back at least 15% of the equity, around £200 million, in this financial year. That's the year to May 2024. And they've begun to do it. They've now hastened this by having a tender offer, which will be completed in the next week or two. And, you know, essentially, he likes his own portfolio, and why not buy it on a 40 discount? And it will have a material effect on NAV, the net asset value, if they buy back all these shares, will go up somewhere between 5 and 7%. But it brings in a new buyer for the shares, and they have begun to edge a little bit tighter in terms of discount. So the discount's probably in the mid-30s. Mid-30s now. now, yeah. And the board are actually saying, if it's a good deal, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it in the future as well. We're going to dedicate more money to it. And that is an expression of confidence as well, is it not, in the NAV? It is, and it, very much so. Confidence in their own portfolio. And also, Pantheon has probably got one of the strongest balance sheets amongst the private equity sector. It's got some net cash, and it's got a big RCF, effectively, overdraft facility. So it can easily accommodate this. And I think it will reap the benefits, and I hope the share price does too. And I hope also others in the sector look at this and say, well, actually, Pantheon might have something here. And you're also a significant owner in uh, Oakley Capital as well, which is the other one that's doing quite well. I've got big positions in HG Capital is my biggest position in the growth portfolio. Oakley Capital's in the top 10, ICG Enterprise, Pantheon. And in the income portfolio, I've got big position in NB private equity, which actually has performed pretty well, and also Apex Global Alpha. And both of them pay a dividend from capital, so arguably are doing a bit in terms of capital allocation already. But similarly, they are at reasonably wide discounts as well. So I just think, you know, the share prices were pricing these trusts for a very nasty recession. That could still happen. But if it doesn't, there is actually quite considerable upside, particularly now there's more shareholder-friendly policies happening with some of these investment trusts. One final point on that, there's obviously been a lot of talk about cost disclosure and whether or not that's been a factor in the absence of buyers uh, for investment trusts generally, but specifically for private equity. I mean, that problem hasn't gone away, but do you think that's going to be resolved? And if so, that will be a further benefit. But if not, then it could still be a drag on, on sentiment towards them. It could be, and, and it may put off some of the private wealth audience. But it's amazing, you know, once you get share prices moving, and possibly NAVs as well, but share prices moving, how suddenly there's no longer an absence of buyers. And where it's the retail sector, the multi-asset sector, smaller private wealth managers who maybe don't have quite the same restrictions as some of the big ones, and suddenly... You know, everything's moving with forward positive momentum. But there's no doubt that underlying costs are higher for private equity. And I always ask them about costs and I think they should be lower. But at the same time, it is more costly to run a private equity business. I think sometimes carry and performance fees are too much. But nonetheless, remember, it's about not losing sight of the wood from the trees because most of them, outperform the all share index over the long run by handsome margins. So if you exclude that, you're excluding quite a decent subsector of the investment company universe, which has got a great performance record. Which you can't readily access in any other way if you're a private investor anyway. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So what's the third theme, Peter? We've had private equity and UK equities. What's the third theme? Well, well the third theme is kind of almost a double negative. It's just <laughs> to say I'm holding on to what I call secular growth trusts or trusts that invest in not just high growth companies, but those with a secular theme and in particular technology, healthcare, biotechnology. They've obviously been horrible performers in 2022 in particular. But interestingly, Jonathan, nine months to end September, year to date, my best two performing investment trusts, which I've added to over the summer, have been Polar Cap Technology and Alliance Technology up 29 and 25% respectively. That's not too shabby. And the reason I added to them is because that's the way for me as an investment trust investor to gain significant exposure to 
US megatech companies like Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, etc., and Facebook. And also, both of these trusts have got very sizable holdings, 8 9% in NVIDIA. Which, of course, you knew last year was going to take off this year. Um, <laughs> and and, and, uh, and I'd just say to the audience, if they want the algorithms, please speak to Jonathan. He's a, a, te- a technological guru. I think, though, if you're looking for beneficiaries of AI, the immediate one is NVIDIA because it dominates oh, the, the market for chips by some considerable distance. But the likes of Microsoft and some of these big companies are the Im- immediate beneficiaries. Microsoft owns 49% of OpenAI, which is the owner of, the inventor of ChatGPT, and that may or may not have an IPO in the next year or two. But it gives an example how Microsoft will will benefit. And And also, of course, any kind of AI development requires a lot more uh, capacity in, in the sky. Use. And uh, that's, of course, Amazon and, uh, and, 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 and Microsoft, and Microsoft and, and are cloud businesses. dominant players in that market, too. They, they are. I would have to say, though, that technology, particularly biotech businesses, but tech as well, that don't have lots of revenues and profits are actually still being ignored and are out of favour by the market. I mean, biotechs are case in point. There's a lot of very interesting businesses really undervalued. And so it's not widespread. It's I bought these two trusts for those reasons. And I think when we eventually get to the stage, if we ever do, when the financial environment is a bit more positive and rates may begin to come down, then you can spread out the offering or your holdings in this area. And there are a lot more other trusts, biotech growth, worldwide healthcare. Edinburgh Worldwide is a good trust there. It's got a lot of small... Herald in the UK, all of them at very sizable discounts, but you probably have to be patient. You might have to wait into later next year for hopefully them to come through. So that's some things you've been doing. You must have got rid of one or two things as well along the way. What have you been reducing or getting rid of in, in order to fund all this? Well, I've certainly sold down property related holdings in both income and growth portfolios. So Supermarket Income REIT, Assura, Civitas, which I held, was bid for and was happy to lose that one. Urban Logistic REITs, all of them have gone out the door. And it's not that they're bad companies. In fact, they're all actually quite good companies. But I think the outlook for property is still a bit clouded. Asset values will fall, could be falling for the next 12 months. In some cases, dividends are being brought into question. And also, in certain cases, ratings are still not, I think, reflecting the you know the longer term outlook for certain areas of the property sector. And also, when you run a closed end fund, you have other ideas. These are just ones that are less attractive for me now. So I've certainly been producing that. And in the growth portfolio, I sold out of Midwind, which had been a long term winner for us. Manager change there. So I just decided to step aside. We may come back to it in due course. But again, if you've got other areas you want to invest in, then sometimes you have to sacrifice ones that are just a bit out of favour at the moment. And that's an example there. So it doesn't sound like you're yet in the position of what I think Warren Buffett used to say as a kid in a candy store, because everything out there is cheap, basically, or at least everything could be cheap in the investment trust sector, but possibly not commercial property. But we haven't quite reached there because of the macro factors, and the macro factors are really what's driving it. Yeah, I think, yes, they are. And I think a lot depends on your investment perspective. If you are genuinely taking a five-year view, I think there are a lot of bargains, a lot of discounts, mid-teens, high-teens of perfectly decent companies. But if you're looking for performance, say over the next 12 months, certainly the next three or six months, I think I've said already, I'm, the outlook is quite uncertain. But I do think these are themes I've, I've outlined to you. Hopefully it will come through in the next year, 18 months. But longer term, there are a lot of areas where uh, you know discounts are so wide. Just I mean, some of the renewables, I've got Greencoat UK Wind, it used to sell on a five, seven, nine premium. It's now on a 20 plus discount. It's got a dividend yield that's growing at RPI. That's 13%. And it's yielding kind of six and a half plus. Now, 
Okay, you can get a decent level of yield from either cash or bonds, but that yield is growing. In real and, terms, yeah. And the assets are at a huge discount. So I don't think it's going to turn around in the very short term, but I'm happy to hold it. I suppose there's a lot of bad sentiment there because of what's happening in the wind business. A lot of developers are struggling to develop. But of course, UK Wind is not a developer. It only buys and operates plants. And uh, net zero is still uh, a target of sorts. We don't quite know how much is going to be diluted by the new government's priorities. So you have an income class and you mentioned the comparison yield on uh, UK Wind, but you're uh, matching that in your own trust, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, our dividend yield at the moment is 6.7%. That's we, the highest it's been probably for it, a long time. It's the highest it's ever been. It's ever been. Uh, it's growing. At, we just increased the first quarter dividend by 8%. And we trade at par because we've been issuing shares, actually, quite a few Into share this market, which is impressive. Yeah, which yeah. is interesting. I've been repurchasing shares in the growth portfolio because growth, as we've discussed at length here, is, remains out of favour. But that's also trading, I think, at a discount of 1% or 2%. So we, we try and keep both lines as close as we can to par, either through issuance or an active buyback policy. And one sort of topical issue I thought that we could just about finish on, I mean, this week we heard of a, another proposed merger in the investment trust sector. This is involving two Henderson trusts, Henderson High Income and uh, Diversified Income. I think you own one of those shares, uh, Henderson High Income, which is going to remain, and diversified income is going to be uh, folded into it, uh, unless all the shareholders take the cash option. What do you make of that uh, as an investor in the high income trust? And you are expecting to see more consolidation, presumably, over the next few weeks and months. Yes, definitely. And there's been a steady stream of these announcements. I think this is a good one. From the point of view of a Henderson high income shareholder, it will increase the size of Henderson high income. It will reduce costs a little, but it should also add to the liquidity of the trust. It tended to trade close to asset value anyway. I mean, it yields somewhere between 65 and 7%, I think. And it gives you some capital growth as well. And so I think that's good. And I think you will see more of this happening. We've already seen some happening. But, you know, with discounts where they are, I wouldn't be surprised to see more consolidation activity. And then my final, final question, Peter, as on the previous question, has to be about rugby, a game that you played with great distinction back in the day. You are a Scotsman and, well, (laughs) I don't want to insult a whole nation, but I mean, Scots are known for for bemoaning their bad luck on occasions. And uh, in the World Cup, you have got to play in the group with Ireland and France, who are the two favourites. And you've got a big match, which may have been played by the time you listen to this podcast. It's being played on this Saturday. Uh, Should we be hoping for a, a famous upset? Most definitely, Jonathan. And uh, it's, it was Ireland and South Africa who are number one and number two in the world. Sorry, Ireland and South Africa. Which was say, yeah. some jiggery come pokery in the draw, <laughs> which is all I'll say. And how England got a group with the Blind Asylum and Wales too defeats me. However, we'll do our very best to see off Ireland. I have to say they're a very good team. And so I think it's a long shot. But you never know, a couple of early red cards might just help us on our way. We keep our fingers crossed. And this is the best Scottish rugby team probably we've had for a while, with a good coach and a, yeah, and a brilliant fly half and all the rest of it. team, but they could get ejected at the group stage. But nonetheless, we'll do our best. And you never know, we do live in hope. We do live in hope. And can I say, I also hope for England to do well and get as far as they can, and Wales also would be my thoughts. Very good. Well, that was Peter Hewitt, the manager of the CT Global Managed Portfolio Trust. On next to my uh, conversation with Matt Hose, the analyst who's responsible for covering alternative asset trusts at the Brokers Jefferies. Well, there's only one place we can start this week's conversation, Matt, and that is with what's going on in the bond market and the fallout from that, which has obviously rippled through into the pricing of alternative asset trusts Mm. in particular other sectors of the market also affected by what's happening. I read today that this is the most dramatic bond bear market in history, measured in terms of scale and speed. So it has been quite a dramatic turn of events. The last few weeks have accelerated. It's no surprise, therefore, that the alternative assets in particular have been taking a beating because everybody is just pricing them off what's happening to the bond market, or so it seems to me anyway. Yeah, I think it might be the most dramatic investment company bear market in history as well. So clearly, uh, the two things are linked. So, look, I mean, just looking at my screen today, 
I can see the 20 or the 30 year guilt yield has breached 5%. And so, as you say, clearly there's a link between the valuations of uh, funds, which value their portfolios on a DCF basis, and that yield. I mean, higher yields mean all things equal, discount rates are probably going up. And I think we've been in this cycle where discount rates are increasing for about a year now. But what's interesting with this leg is we're now at a point where inflation expectations are starting to ebb. So you may get discount rates having another leg up and reducing NAVs without the offset of higher inflation assumptions. And so that will be a little bit painful for the fund. And clearly they're reflecting that in their current pricing. What they're also reflecting, I think, is just more technical weakness. I mean, speaking to our sales and trading desk, we've got a lot more sellers than buyers. And I think that's created a bit of route, a route in prices over the last couple of weeks. You say that's a technical factor. That's just a market for you, right? I mean, <laughs> more sellers than buyers and prices are going to have to adjust. I guess the point about the bond yields, though, is this. I mean, it's true there is a connection between what happens to short-term interest rates and bond yields and indeed longer-term bond yields with the discount rate that they use to discount the cash flows. But of course, a lot of these alternative asset trusts have cash flows that stretch out a long way into the future. And there's no certainty that this uh, particular spike in bond yields is going to persist for long. So what I'm trying to make the point here is there's a short-term change in bond yields. It doesn't necessarily mean that over the course of the life of the alternative asset trusts that the discount rate will need to be higher. Uh, It's a mathematical thing rather than necessarily a reflection of reality. Would that be a fair comment? It is purely a mathematical thing, but that's, in effect, the way discount rates are set. They're set based on a risk premium for whatever the assets are and a risk-free rate over the tenure of the assets. And that risk-free rate is a sort of 20 or 30 year. That's what the the discount rates look to. And so when the long bond does sell off like that, it does have an impact on discount rates. It's just, it's, it's purely a sort of a mechanical thing, as you say. Right. So it's a mechanical thing, and it may or may not be right. That's the point. But that is reflect the NAVs. But the share prices, you know, you'd think that at some point the markets would actually be able to discern whether that was a realistic new framework or not. Because at some point, these things are going to come very good value. I mean, I'm trying to put a a brave spin on things that are happening at the moment. No, I think that's completely right. I think when the market has a bit more confidence about interest rates that reach a, a terminal level, then that won't immediately be reflected in NAVs, but that will, I think, immediately be reflected in, in share prices. And I think we'll see a rally in share prices via discounts narrowing. But clearly, you know, we've been looking for a terminal rate now for six months, and um, this just seems to just drag on. There was some hope, I think, earlier in the summer that uh, we might have reached the peak in interest rates, and therefore there was a bit of a pickup in some of these alternatives. But, I mean, I'm just looking at the kind of averages over the year to date, it's still pretty dramatic what's happened. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, private equity obviously has done better on average than uh, some of the other sectors. But infrastructure, you know, down 22%, commercial Mm. property down 16%, and debt also uh, have sold off a little bit as well, debt trusts. So what are your clients saying to you at this point, Matt? You know, are they looking for a recovery or are they still in kind of not exactly panic selling mode, but in automated selling mode, if I can put it that way? I think there's some people out there who are just focused on their existing holdings and speaking with management teams and boards about how clearly they can close discounts and they can extract some value and, you know, and move share prices closer to NAVs. There's other people which are looking at things on a sort of a fresh view. We speak to new investors all the time, which see the current discounts, can't make that much sense of them and are interested in the funds and the assets. Well, let's take at one or two of the sectors in more detail then. Let's start with private equity, where obviously we've had quite a wide range of experience this year. We've had some trusts, notably 3i, doing particularly well, if you count them as a private equity trust, and Literacy Capital doing okay. There are a couple reporting this week, or making announcements this week, and that's ICG Enterprise Trust and NB Private Equity Partners. You've been looking at them. What are your thoughts about those two? What did they have to say this week? And uh, was there anything particularly striking about them from your point of view? So two very different events. ICG Enterprise was an interim results, which effectively contained a Q2 NAV. That NAV was up very slightly. I think within those results, you can see that earnings growth is ticking along at a decent level. There's some exits are coming through. But I mean, it feels like the fund and the sector is just poised for a lot more. One of the themes we've been exploring for the recent recent months is 
these sort of green shoots in exit activity because the IPO window has started. It's, you know, it's now slightly ajar. And so we can see that with ICG Enterprise and we can see that with other funds that if we get more exits coming through, then that means more cash flows to the funds. That's more validation of the NAVs. And also they can use those cash flows to fund things like share buybacks. So that would be a very good circumstance for the funds. On MBPE, the event there was it was a capital markets event where the management team used that event to talk about the co-investment strategy for the fund, return drivers for private equity in the current environment, and how one interesting feature, how they've rolled over certain investments where they could have exited. And so that means that basically they kept the money on the table because they think that those investments are, are particularly attractive. And we thought that was an interesting feature of that fund. So that is, by implication, a sort of more positive view in a way. Of, uh, there will be better opportunities to do something with these companies rather than get rid of them now. Is, is that what you're saying? That's right, yeah. I mean, that, that fund in particular doesn't have any commitments, any material commitments to fund. So it doesn't have to take exit opportunities when it's offered them. And now, with the potential sort of rollover investments, then if they're comfortable in those investments, then that makes sense. And what they were able to demonstrate in a very good slide is that of the investments that they've rolled over, they've generated gains of sort of 1.3 times. So they've sort of vindicated that decision to roll over those investments rather than heading for the exit. Right. So you might see some optimism there, a little bit of optimism there in relative terms anyway. One of the significant things that's happened in the last couple of months is that uh, Pantheon has taken this very uh, blunderbrush approach to share buybacks and offering a tender as well uh, in the attempt to reduce the discount. How is that going to be treated by the other private equity trusts? Are they going to follow suit or is it just that uh, Pantheon has specific factors around them that allows them to do that when others may be more reluctant to do it? There's a sort of specific factor in Pantheon in that if you go back a couple of years, Pantheon had what we felt was sort of excess liquidity on its balance sheet. So you measure sort of liquidity by looking at sort of commitment coverage. To what extent can they cover their commitments by cash and credit facilities? And a couple of years ago, they had sort of 100% cover. And that sounds like the norm, but in reality, you don't need 100% cover because your commitments are drawn over multiple years and really you need... Sort of 30, 40, 50% cover. So that was a, a unique situation, really. But more generally, I think the thing to note is that other funds do return capital. I mean, they're not the first fund in the sector to have a buyback program. And some of the other funds in the sector, you know, like an APAX or an MB, return capital via dividend as well. Our overall view is we see buybacks as it can be a very good opportunity for NAV accretion. But what we actually see, we see it as a liquidity release valve is that. If you have got too much liquidity on your balance sheet, it can make sense to buy back and return that liquidity to shareholders and, and sort of tighten up the balance sheet a bit. And that's what we see Pantheon is effectively doing. And any, any benefits for NAV accretion and closing the discount is clearly welcome as well. Okay, so let's talk about the infrastructure trust next. Obviously, the core of the mid-market social infrastructure trusts have been really badly beaten up this year. What do you take from your recent conversations with them, I mean, the likes of BBGI or international public partnerships. What's the message that you take from what they've been saying? And what do you think about the way in which the market has uh, treated them? So the problem those funds face is the discount rates compared to some other funds are still relatively low. You've got discount rates of around about 8%. And so what those funds need to do, and this is predominantly sort of Hickel, IMPP is, is moved to sort of higher discount rates. And so you're not in the bond proxy type territory. And that's actually what the funds we think are doing. I mean, we've seen Hickel do some very interesting disposals and they'll clearly use some of that for RCF pay down. But some of the proceeds may be used to reinvest into higher return assets and move the overall return of the vehicle onto that sort of higher plane. BPGI is a bit different there because we actually think the discount rate is quite conservative because of how low risk the portfolio is. What do you think the most likely path from here then is? Is it that the discount rate will be raised and the NAVs will come down and the share prices will stabilise, meaning the discount sort of narrows? Or is it that actually we will see the discount narrowing of its own accord as well as just from that uh, effect from reductions in NAV? So remember, there's, there's actually two ways to increase your discount rate. Clearly, you can increase it on the existing portfolio, which means a lower NAV, but also you can increase it through rotating your assets, so selling the lower discount rate assets and buying things higher up the sort of risk return spectrum. So I think we'll see both from the funds. 
But longer term, that makes the funds have a more interesting return profile and certainly a more competitive one versus bonds. Because remember, in those funds, you're in levered equity. So you clearly need a, a material risk premium versus bonds. And if they, if they can achieve that, then I think the prospects are good because the assets are generally high quality and I think they're well-managed funds. Okay, so then let's just talk about the renewables, which are slightly different factors involved in them. Mm-hmm. What have you taken from the recent results that uh, we've had from the renewable trusts? We've had a number of quarters of small negative NAV movements. Part of that is discount rates. Part of that is power prices because the forward power price curve has continued to sort of trend down over recent quarters. And the main takeaway is that's not really going to change over the coming quarters. So we're probably looking at some further NAV weakness. What's interesting, though, is that we're starting to see more evidence of active capital allocation because, you know, we've seen Trig do a small disposal. Um, t- actually, today we saw Octopus do a, an interesting transaction where it sold two Polish assets at a material premium to NAV. And it will use those proceeds for debt pay down and funding development pipeline, which is interesting. So I think looking forward, we're probably going to see more of these capital recycling transactions and hope that validates NAVs and repays you know, some expensive RCF debt and should ultimately be positive for share prices. And it might be worth just reminding uh, listeners of why things like battery storage and so on have been hit much more than the more established renewables, because they're basically in a, in a different kind of business. This is a much more uh, a higher risk business where you don't have the same certainty of cash flows and so on. Is that the story there? Yeah, that's right. You don't really have contracted income from batteries. You have two main sources of income. One is sort of ancillary services, which is providing services to the grid. And the other is in effect of arbitrage or trading. So the income is a lot more volatile than certainly infrastructure, but even renewables, and which have you know, some sort of power price and subsidy revenue. With battery storage, there's been two issues. It's number one, the near-term outlook for that trading revenue is actually pretty weak. And the funds have been reflecting that in their forward-looking assumptions. And the others is just there's a number of challenges in the battery storage market when you're, you're looking to construct and sort of roll out new projects. There's a number of bottlenecks in terms of grid connections. A number of contractors have been going bust. And so there's a great sort of medium term growth story with those funds where they roll up more projects at the construction stage. They take up lifts when those projects become operational. But at the moment, there's been delays to projects and that hasn't really helped that sort of nav story. And do you think we're going to see more consolidation in this sector? One or two trusts will disappear for one mean or another. Is that quite likely? And will the more recent ones be those that are the most vulnerable? The more vulnerable ones are always going to be the smaller ones, really. That's the issue. So, so, you know, funds which due to unfortunate timing and IPOs just haven't ramped up to the level they need to to get their overall cost down. So I think that's something to look at. But it's, yeah, it's difficult. Other than that, it's difficult to sort of try and pick which ones could be subject to M&A. I think... Takeouts is one potential option for some of these funds. But again, it can be difficult to diligence. So we see impediments. Let me ask you also then, just moving again across other sectors, uh, interesting things that have been in the headlines and a lot of people are talking about. And the obvious one here is Hypnosis Songs Fund, one which everybody seems to have an extraordinary interest in, ticker S-O-N-G. We know that the board has put forward a proposal to sell some assets to... uh, what is effectively a related party, I suppose you could say, uh, Blackstone and the uh, management company. What do you think is going to be the outcome? Just remind us what the timetable is on this one. There's a couple of crucial votes coming up on the same day, a vote on the proposal and a vote on a continuation vote. Remind us what the timetable is and then what do you think the options are as far as the outcome is concerned? So those votes, in effect, take place at the same time. That's right at the end of this month. And then as to the outcome, there's an FT article this lunchtime saying that shareholders are minded to vote against both the asset sale and continuation. So the next question, I mean, where does that leave the fund? Well, that leaves the fund with a very wide discount, I mean, too high leverage. And really, the board then have to come back, I think, and look to wind down the portfolio. Now, one way to do that would be to actually serve notice on the manager, which then triggers the manager's right to acquire the portfolio based on, a, I think it's a calculation, which is based on the hire of a third-party bid, the share price and fair value, but it's going to be basically fair value. 
So I think in that situation, it becomes interesting. But clearly, I don't think you know, the board haven't covered themselves in glory with this transaction. So shareholders are very sceptical at this stage. And I imagine um, there was a few concessions from the board and the manager in the EGM and AGM circular. But I imagine shareholders are still trying to um, get further concessions ahead of that vote. First question on that is then, if they terminate the contract and we go into this process where, as you say, there's three ways of determining what the value is, whose job would it be to determine fair value? It looks like it would be the independent valuer, but in reality, you may have to use a different valuer. And it's worth noting there are other valuers out there. The value of song is not the only valuer in the market. Indeed, but I mean, one of the issues have been around the valuation that has been adopted Mm -hmm. Would you like to uh, hazard a guess as to the outcome? The ultimate, I think, I mean, conversations I've had with shareholders, very few have got anything positive to say on the transaction. One thing we haven't talked about is the go shop provision, where in theory, another buyer for the catalogs they want to dispose of could sort of come over the hill. But that's unlikely, given that the, the way they've structured that and the fact that Blackstone and the manager have this matching right. So um, I don't think anyone's sort of holding their breath that um, that sort of go shop provision comes to sort of fruition. Obviously, I mean, the point behind that is it would be nice to get a third party along to make an offer, which at then at least you wouldn't just have the Blackstone, the management company, uh, whatever they're prepared to pay for it. But on, I mean, on song, just generally, one thing people talk about the ins and outs of the votes and the, the structure of the transaction. But one thing people aren't talking about is actually the share price. And we look at it today and we've got a share price of 75p where there's a lot of bad news baked into that share price. And it's a messy situation, but it's still a situation where we could see shareholders ending up with a much higher value than is currently represented by the market price of the shares. Yes, it's odd, isn't it? Can you remind us what the proposed transaction, what the implied price for that was? It depends on how many things you add to it, because they lose the income on it, there's a tax. But roundabout, it's a 25% reduction from fair value. Which would translate to what in terms of a, of a price? Well, then you've got to apply the twenty, arguably the twenty five percent reduction on the remaining part of the portfolio, whether or not it goes through. So I can't do that. Those maths it's off my head, but you've still got the cushion now of a fifty, of a 50 discount to the current share price. So, like I said, there's a lot of negative news around write downs and governance priced in at that level. Yeah. So the only odd thing here is that when the deal was first announced, or at least the share price did pick up. And then it's come all the way back down again to where it was before that announcement, I think. So basically, uh, there's still something to play for, is essentially what you're saying here. Yeah, I think, I think there is, yeah. So finally, Matt, so looking ahead, how optimistic are you that we might actually be near the bottom of this? You've given some reasons why NAVs might uh, be coming down in one or two sectors. But do you think we're close to the floor? Let's put it that way. I mean, there have been attempts to put out a case for buying uh, at these levels. Is that one that you would be happy to be associated with? In other words, are we close to the bottom, do you think? No, I mean, I think we look across the sector and we see management teams and boards starting to react to their share prices with things like share buybacks, capital allocation decisions, selling assets. So that's helpful. We're starting to see a little bit of M&A come through, like with the Roundhill deal. So that's helpful. But really, I think if you wanted to call the bottom then you've also got to call the top of the rate cycle. I think that's the thing which is going to drive certainly you know, share prices not going lower and particularly the, you know, the first leg up is that terminal rate and when we get there. And until we get some visibility over that, it's really difficult to be mega bullish. I mean, we can pick out certain situations where we think prices are overdone, but across the sector, that's what we need to see. You don't think that this is something of a death knell for the alternatives sector of the investment trust world? I mean, bearing in mind that a large part of the alternatives only came to in the investment trust world after the global financial crisis because of all sorts of reasons that were to do with the banking system in large part. You don't think that there is an existential threat over the alternative assets if we go back to a world where bond yields remain around 4 or 5% as they were before the global financial crisis? I'm slightly sort of talking my own book here, but now I don't. You've got to think about the investment trust structure and what is it good for. And it's good for holding illiquid assets, whether they're growth assets or income assets. It's good for applying a little bit of structural leverage to those assets as well. And so I think what we're going to see is we'll see the alternative part of the investment company sector shift more towards growth rather than income. And obviously, income has been a feature, as you say, since the GFC. 
I think we'll see that via more income type vehicles winding up and some growth vehicles eventually launched. And we'll also see the, a lot of the existing vehicles move their sort of base returns higher so they can compete in a world where bonds yield five or six percent. So I think the one thing when you look over time is what the investment company sector is, is very good at is renewal and finding other areas to explore other interesting assets to bring into the structure. And I think that will happen in the future. It's just slightly dark days right now. Indeed. So that was Matt Hose, the Alternatives Asset Analyst at Jefferies, and hoping for some better news in due course. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.